Hi, everyone. Welcome to our May Wellness Wednesday, Finding Ease in Body and Voice Expression, Speech and Posture for Brain Health. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Um, my name is Katie, and I'm a program assistant for the BC Brain Wellness Program. Thanks again for joining us for today's session. Um, I'd like to start off the session today by first acknowledging that the BC Brain Wellness Program at the uh, Javid Moafagian Center for Brain Health is situated on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Hunkamid-speaking Musqueam people. Um, I'm joining today from my family home in Victoria, which is located on the traditional territory of the Songhees and the Esquimalt Nations. So I invite all of you to also take a moment to reflect and give thanks to the lands where you're joining us from today, wherever that may be in the world. Um, so in line with Speech and Hearing Month in May, we've invited three fantastic speakers to share their expertise with us in all things speech and posture today. Um, we're joined by speech language pathologists Sherry Zelazny and Dr. Linda Ramage, as well as Mark Vasek, who's an occupational therapist and expert in the Alexander Technique. Um, just a couple of housekeeping notes as well before we get started. Um, if everyone has any questions during the session today, please feel free to type them in the chat box and our speakers will answer them towards the end of the session if we have time left over. Um, and please note that this session is also being recorded and it'll be posted on our website at bcbrainwellness.ca under the events tab in about one to two weeks time. So without further ado, I'll introduce our first speaker, um, Sherry Zelazny. Sherry is a registered speech language pathologist with more than, of, than 30 years of experience. Um, she first began her career as a general SLP in Lanconia, where she worked for 15 years. She then went on to pursue advanced clinical expertise in voice and laryngeal airway management at the University of Wisconsin-Madison Voice and Swallow Clinics, where she worked as a member of a dynamic team of SLPs and laryngologists. She's presented nationally on a variety of voice and laryngeal airway topics, and her areas of special interest include uh, voice evaluation and treatment, paradoxal voice fold motion, voice therapy for Parkinson's disease, gender affirming voice training, and community education. She holds the College of Speech and Hearing Health Professionals BC Advanced Competency for Flexible Endoscopic Evaluation of Voice and Swallowing, and is an LSVT certified clinician. Sherry is also a member of the Board of Directors of Parkinson's Society of British Columbia and was the past president of Speech and Hearing BC. And she's also the owner and director of the Vo uh, Surrey Voice Clinic. So with that, welcome Sherry and um, please take the floor. Thanks very much. Uh, very happy to be here and uh, to see so many people interested in the, in the topic of communication and swallowing today. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Okay. So I am uh, going to give you a, a brief, quick run through communication and swallowing uh, disorders, identifying a communication or swallowing disorder and how to go about um, uh, evaluation and treatment. Uh, as we said, just some disclosures, I am a registered speech language pathologist with a private practice. I am uh, very proud to be a member of the Board of Directors of Parkinson's Society, uh, and I've been involved with uh, Speech and Hearing BC for many years. So really today, uh, we're talking about this one instrument that we have, our, our body, and uh, we need our, our body and uh, all our systems to work really well together to do uh, everything they need to do. And especially for communication and swallowing, um, we need uh, these uh, complex systems to work together um, so that we can communicate effectively, so that we can uh, enjoy our meals and not be choking. Um, and anything that happens somewhere in our body can uh, trigger or lead to issues with communication, uh, especially voice, which I tend to talk about a little bit more sometimes than communication. But if, if something happens to the muscle balance of your larynx, if something is happening with your breathing, if there's issues uh, with your articulators, then, then these really complex skills we have of communication and swallowing can be affected. 
So we talk about communication and swallowing together because it is the same uh, set of systems and the same brain, the same nerves that coordinate both those systems. So certainly we need our brain uh, for both. For communication, we need to uh, generate ideas. We need to know language. We need to have vocabulary. We need to understand things. And we need to put motor uh, action into action. So communication and swallowing are both motor activities. So they come from the motor centers of our brain. Um, and then we've got our respiratory system that of course gives us our breath support. Uh, we have our larynx and our vocal folds that are certainly important for voice, but your larynx is in your laryngeal airway and that is responsible for protecting your lungs and your uh, trachea when you swallow so nothing goes down the wrong pipe. We have lots of resonant space in our head uh, for vo our voice to resonate in um, and that makes for a voice that's clear and heard well. Um, and then we have our articulators, our lips, our teeth, our tongue, our palate, all super important for swallowing and speech and how well we are understood. Um, and really kind of from the brain down when you're talking about generating ideas or having um, an intention to communicate or an intention to eat, uh, we need to set those patterns in. And then kind of from your lungs up, you need to have that power. Uh, to, to make the system work, to coordinate your swallowing, to coordinate your voice, to coordinate your articulators. Um, and it's quite easy, as we all know, to have something slip up in those areas. Uh, we've all had something go down the wrong pipe. If, if you're having a conversation and somebody says something funny and you've taken a drink of water and then you start to laugh, then the whole coordination of the system uh, can lead that liquid down the wrong pipe and then you'll be coughing and feeling like you're choking. Um, so it just, again, so important to have all these systems working well together um, with the right motor activity that, that needs to uh, happen to keep us safe. And one thing that I think sometimes we forget about when we're talking about communication is hearing. So it's always super important uh, if you feel like you're having trouble with communication that that everybody have their hearing checked. The, the speaker, the listener, uh, we can't forget how important hearing is in our uh, ability to communicate successfully. So what is a communication disorder? Uh, this is, you know, uh, uh, you know, a deeper definition of communication disorder. Uh, it has to do with how well our, we have an ability to receive information, send information, process information. Um, and, and again, with communication, speech uh, is not the only way we communicate. We communicate with facial expression. We communicate with gestures. We communicate with pictures. We communicate with signs. Um, so it's a, a process of understanding what your what the communication is coming to you under being able to communicate to somebody with you. Uh, processes of hearing language or speech, it can certainly be mild to severe. Communication disorders can be uh, developmental from birth or acquired like those that may happen with a stroke. Uh, and it can be a primary disability like uh, fluency, or it can be secondary to other problems such as, um, you know, uh, brain disease or another uh, neurological impairment. But the bottom line is, a it, if there's been a change in your communication, that is enough for you to say, I would like some evaluation. So if you think that something in your communication has changed, then it is important to follow up on it. Um, you are the only person that knows if there's been a change, if it's very subtle, um, and it's our job to take your information and, and understand what's happening and, and evaluate and help you. So for communication, uh, some things that you might start to notice uh, or pay attention to for uh, signs and symptoms of communication uh, impairments or disorders or changes, slurred speech, uh, which would involve your articulators, 
changes in nasality, which might involve your palate. So too much nasality or hypernasal or not enough nasality. For example, when you have a cold and you're very stuffy, um, then there's not enough air moving through your nose for your voice. Hoarseness, of course, a new onset of stuttering or fluency uh, problems, decreased loudness. We know that's a very, very common uh, sign of communication issues with Parkinson's. Word finding problems, again, articulation, shortness of breath with talking. If it's taking you more effort uh, to produce your voice or communicate, vocal fatigue. I've got nasality in there twice. Um, if you feel like you've lost some inflection, maybe you don't have your high notes anymore, or you're having trouble communicating um, feelings or emotions, which we do through our intonation patterns. Tremor, uh, if somebody's having tremor, whether it be essential tremor or tremor related to Parkinson's disease, uh, you, that can manifest in the larynx as well. So you might feel like you have a shaky voice that you didn't have before. The other thing I want to say about communication changes is sometimes they can be the first sign of something more significant going on. So we know that, for example, with Parkinson's, you, uh, communication problems can often come early and first, um, where somebody might think, I've got some changes in my voice. And then as you go through evaluation, uh, we might see that it's leading to a bigger, a bigger issue. Also, um, ALS, multiple sclerosis, uh, stroke. Uh, communication problems with a stroke can be the, one of the first signs. So, um, you know, that's not always the first thing that we go to when somebody's having problems, but it's important uh, for early identification of communication changes that if you think something different is happening, that is the right time to pursue uh, some investigation and evaluation. And also with communication, what you might notice is that you're having trouble participating in a conversation, maybe more trouble communicating in the workplace, maybe you're not as effective in the workplace as you used to be, maybe you find yourself repeating a lot or, or trying to get somebody to understand what you're saying. Uh, we have two types of intelligibility or clarity. There's speech intelligibility um, that has to do with your actual speech sounds and the accuracy of your speech sounds. And there's also voice intelligibility. So if somebody has some hoarseness, for example, laryngitis with an illness, it is harder to understand that person. Maybe you're frustrated by your communication. Maybe you have uh, stopped uh, participating in some social activities and you're not quite sure why you don't feel like uh, talking uh, socially anymore. Maybe you stopped answering the phone. And at a very, very basic level, um, expressing our wants and needs is really what communication is all about. Um, we need to be able to say, I'm hungry, I love you, I'm in pain. Um, those things are so, so important uh, for wants and needs. All right, like I said, flash, flash, uh, flash course through communication and swallowing. So let's talk about swallowing for just a couple minutes. Um, again, very dynamic, complex system um, with the same, uh, same systems involved in communication. In this picture, if you can see my mouse, the green is the bolus of food, food or food, uh, food being formed into a ball in your mouth. And you can see, uh, we all know this, you put food in your mouth and then it comes down. Uh, you have to protect your airway and then the food goes down the esophagus and then your airway opens. You have one second by, be, by the time you trigger your swallow in the back of your mouth to get the food into your esophagus. So from, from here in the back of the mouth to here, you've got one second there to get your airway protected, um, which is why it's so important to, to have that airway protection. Um, and you can see why it might be um, uh, tricky sometimes to have everything happening at the same time. So if we talk about uh, swallowing a little bit more, dysphagia or dysphagia is the, is the medical word for swallowing 
problems, swallowing disorders. You know, with, with communication, we have many words that talk about uh, communication disorders, aphasia, cognitive disorders, uh, hoarseness, dysphonia, um, dystonia. There's many words that uh, might come into a communication disorder, but a swallowing disorder, no matter what the reason, whether it's uh, structural or uh, neurological, it is called dysphagia, dysphagia. So there's basically four stages of swallowing. There's the pre-oral stage, which means you have to get the food or the liquid into your mouth. Uh, that's the first step. That, uh, of course, is a voluntary stage of, of wanting to eat and wanting to have something to drink. Um, then we have the oral phase where you manipulate your food and you form it into a bolus. As soon as you get the food to the back of your mouth, you trigger your swallow reflex. That's involuntary. So what you, once you trigger the swallow reflex, everything else is going to happen. Your, your airway will be protected. Your esophagus will open. And then you get the food into your esophagus. Signs and symptoms of us of swallowing problems. Of course, we all think about coughing and choking. Uh, this can happen during your swallow or if you find yourself coughing and choking after you swallow, that might also be a sign of uh, a problem in one of the phases, the pharyngeal phase or the esophageal phase, if you're, if you're coughing, choking after you swallow. Difficulty with pills, uh, fatigue. So some of these uh, things on this list you may not think of as part of a, a sign or a symptom of a swallowing disorder, um, but if you're getting tired eating, um, if you're getting tired getting the food into your mouth, um, that may ultimately make for a longer meal time and less nutrition if you don't have the energy to eat. So that would be a potential sign of something going on. Nasal regurgitation, of course, you need your palate to close when you swallow so things don't come out your nose. If things are coming out your nose, then we would want to know about that. Uh, sensation of food sticking in your throat, trouble starting your swallow. So if you've got that bolus in your mouth and you're pumping, pumping, pumping to try to get that food backwards to trigger your swallow, that could be um, a sign of some muscular uh, weakness. Uh, changing your diet, taking foods out of your diet. Maybe you didn't realize that you don't want to eat a sandwich anymore. You don't want those chips anymore. Um, thinking about why maybe you've taken some foods out of your diet. Food left in your mouth after you, um, after you chew and swallow. Drooling. Uh, pneumonia, recurrent pneumonia, unintended weight loss. I've got nasal regurgitation in there twice. <laughs> um, sensory changes. So um, maybe after you eat, your voice sounds a little bit wet and gurgly. That means maybe you don't, your sensory system is not sensing that something went down the wrong pipe. That's also very important. So what I want you to really um, understand about communication and swallowing is these these disorders can be very, very distressing. We, we enjoy eating. We get a lot of um, reward from eating with others. And certainly our ability to communicate, especially if we are um, managing a disease or an illness, we have to be able to communicate uh, for wants and needs and our um, feelings and emotions. Early attention is so important. We don't want people to wait until something gets worse or bad. If you think something is changing with your communication and swallowing, it is the right time to talk to a doctor or a speech pathologist. Um, it is the speech language pathologist who is going to do your evaluation for both communication and swallowing. And baselines of baseline evaluations help. And what I mean by that is if you have been diagnosed um, with, some, with something like Parkinson's or multiple sclerosis or um, any number of other things where we know that communication swallowing disorders can be uh, relevant, we want to get an evaluation done. We want to know where you're starting. So first of all, there's many things that, that you may not be aware of yet that we can tease out in an evaluation to be able to help you. And we also want to know what changes over time because that lets us help you as well. Uh, there are both rehab exercises and compensatory strategies for treatment of communication and swallowing disorders. Um, rehab 
is exercises. We, if you're given rehabilitation exercises, we expect things to get stronger and better. And then there's compensatory strategies where you might have some strategies to improve communication and swallowing that will allow you to continue uh, to, to have a good uh, quality of life and function in both those areas. Speech language pathologists, yes, I'm biased. We're an important member of your team. Um, even if uh, you just want information or you need some resources, a speech language pathologist is the person to go to for uh, communication and swallowing. You are your own best advocate, and I know sometimes it's hard to hear that, but even uh, participating with us today um, is helping you build your own knowledge and awareness and education about communication and swallowing disorders. Excuse me. Um, and by doing that, by participating with us today, you are better able to help yourself and better able to identify uh, areas of concern. In terms of referral and evaluation, in general, you don't need a physician's referral to see a speech language pathologist in BC, um, but there may be some stipulations depending on whether you're um, going to get some public services or you're going private. MSP will cover services that are provided in the public si system, for example, a swallowing evaluation or perhaps your communication evaluation uh, with, a neuro, with a neurodiagnosis um, and an MD referral. Some hospitals around will provide short-term outpatient services, but in general, MSP does not cover outpatient speech language evaluation and treatment. Um, the swallowing of that will always be covered because it's always in the hospital. Uh, if you have some extended benefits for speech therapy, then our services are covered uh, within the limits of your benefit. And one, one silver lining of COVID, of course, is that we are all getting very good at telepractice. It's very effective. There's evidence uh, for telepractice. So it really eliminates the need um, often to be traveling all the time to see a speech pathologist. We can do things very effectively um, as we are today. To find a speech language pathologist, you can go to the College of Speech and Hearing Health Professionals to the public register, or you can go to the Find a Professional um, resource at Speech and Hearing BC. So stay calm, call a speech language pathologist. We are always happy to help. Uh, if you have questions about whether you should go for an evaluation, um, having that, that contact with a speech language pathologist uh, is an important first step. So uh, I hope that was an okay, quick run through and I'm happy to take questions at the end of our session today. Perfect. Thank you so much, Sherry, for sharing your expertise and um, outlining all of that great information. That was really informative. Thank you so much. Um, so our next speaker here is Dr. Linda Ramage. Um, Linda is a clinical professor in the Department of Surgery and adjunct professor in the School of Audiology and Speech Sciences at UBC. She has a clinical practice through the Provincial Voice Care Resource Program in uh, VCH, and she completed her um, degrees at UBC and at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, she's the co-founder of Interprofessional Provincial Voice Care Resource Program and has been specializing in voice science and voice disorders in her research, teaching, and clinical activities um, since 1980. Dr. Ramage has also published and lectured internationally on um, the psychopathology assessment and management of voice disorders, voice care, and various voice research projects. She's currently engaged in collaborative uh, research on treatment outcomes after phonosurgery and therapy. And she's the author of several textbooks in management of voice disorders um, and is currently the director and vice chair on the Speech and Language uh, and Audiology Canada Board. So welcome, Linda, um, and take it away. Let me unmute myself. Thanks so much, Katie, for that introduction. Um, just a quick correction. I, I retired from the public service um, last summer. Um, good timing. And I work part time in a private practice at this point. Um, I do have several volunteer activities, but I'm actually no longer on the board of Speech Language and Audiology Canada, but I'm uh, chairing several committees. So well, let's get on to the important things. Um, I would like to share with you today um, a comprehensive model for evaluating individuals who are experiencing voice function um, and to some extent other 
types of dysfunction in the larynx, such as people who are having chronic coughing and choking um, or what we call laryngeal uh, breathing problems. So this is a model that was um, developed, conceived and developed by an interprofessional group that I've worked with for many years, um, including uh, otolaryngologists, um, psychiatrists, um, neurologists, uh, dietitians, and, um, and a number of other people, including uh, uh, vocal pedagogues. So my, my clinic uh, practice has been influenced by many, many different professions. We think of this model as a way of looking at the way uh, um, a variety of factors that can affect voice may ebb and flow over time. Um, and we assume from the four boxes you can see here that any of these elements may play a role in a communication problem, whether or not there are anatomical factors, such as the ones that Sherry um, outlined for you so eloquently. So um, ALERT stands for anatomical, lifestyle, emotional, reflux, and technique factors. All very important factors that can influence how we speak and particularly how our voices work. So I'm gonna spend just a couple of minutes on each of these factors, just to give you a little background on how to use the model. The arrows simply reflect the fact that any of these factors can be more dominant at any particular time. Um, and then for various reasons may recede as being important factors, but they also tend to intersect and overlap with each other. So um, there's some codependency with many of them. Um, so we're going to just move on. And uh, as Sherry described well, the, um, the, the speech and voice production mechanism is very complex. This is just a comic out of one of my books. Um, it's a little more fun to look at than, uh, than the serious anatomical models we, we spend a lot of time poring over. Um, so the breathing equipment is important, your lungs, your rib cage, all the muscles that help them move and function well. Um, the primary vibrator, which is the vocal folds that live inside the larynx or voice box in your neck. Um, the vocal resonators that allow us to get power with no extra effort. Um, all the little mouthpieces, the articulators, the tongue, the, the lips, um, the palate are very important monitoring system that our brain um, looks to for information like our ears and our eyes are the important monitors. And then I think of the brain as the commander in chief in the whole operation. So um, Sherry's outlined some of the anatomical factors that um, may be of interest and certainly significantly affecting your voice or speech or swallowing. Um, but we don't want to um, see uh, lose the forest because we find one tree. Um, so you may have been diagnosed with, for example, a, a neuromotor dysfunction, but that doesn't mean that other anatomical factors may not be playing a role. So an important thing to understand about voice is that the whole vocal system develops um, from the time we're born, it, it grows and matures and becomes more complex as we go get into our teen years and then young adults, and then growth of various types continues essentially through our whole lives. Um, but aging, um, when you get to your middle age and then later on years predicts voice and speech changes. Uh, one of the general patterns we tend to see is because women's vocal folds tend to get a little thicker in some of the lining um, layers. Women's voices tend to get deeper around the menopause period and men predictably um, have thinner vocal folds as they get older. And so their voice pitch may actually get higher, whereas the women's voice is getting lower. Both men and women just from aging factors alone may find that their voice becomes quieter um, and speech may not be quite as clear. Um, and we do know too that speech tends to get slower and um, may not be quite as clear and precise over um, related to the, the brain's patterns of aging and the systems um, 
all basically losing typically some bulk um, in various layer structures. Important thing to keep in mind though, is that aging changes may be reduced or delayed by appropriate voice and speech use and as well as exercise. So there are an, a number of studies in the voice world that demonstrate that physical exercise as well as um, vocal use and speech use um, tend to preserve those functions longer. Um, as you have learned, neurological disease may cause changes, but also changes related to neurological disease um, often can be reduced or delayed by appropriate voice and speech use and exercise. Um, we never want to forget the importance of those um, sensory systems like the eyes and the ears that monitor our speech and our communication partners as we're communicating. So the, the ears are um, incredibly important in giving our brain information about how clearly we're speaking and whether or not we're producing the right message. Um, so predictably, as we get older, our hearing tends to decline and it declines with very specific patterns such as the high frequency noises tend to get lighter and harder to hear um, which is why we sometimes, um, when we get into the, um, the second um, ha half of our century of living, I hope, um, that we, we may accuse people of mumbling because we're hearing the vowel sounds okay, but we're often not hearing some of those high pitched sounds like S's and P's and T's that make our speech sound precise. So we'll talk about a few of the lifestyle factors. Um, there are many things you can probably imagine in your, in your general lifestyle that could affect the way you speak um, and use your voice. We'll go through a few. The obvious one that you've probably been hearing about all your life is that any kind of heat that you put past your vocal folds, such as heat from cigarettes or other things people smoke sometimes is really not good for your airway and it's also not good for your vocal folds. Um, but I think one of the real dominant um, enemies of the voice in our busy noisy world is just the fact that we're talking over background noise. And we're often talking as well in acoustic environments that have the wrong kind of echo. Um, the, the best example I can think of is if you go into a swimming pool environment and you notice that there's just a constant clatter of sound, that's because the reverberation rate is very slow in swimming pool environments um, because of all the hard surfaces predominantly. And um, so sound stays in the room after it's been produced for many, many seconds. So um, reverberation as well as just general background noise makes us stressed. And the stress tends to get translated into stress in the vocal mechanism. It can affect the way our breathing system works when we speak. And it also affects the tension in the larynx or voice box. Vocal dose simply means how much do you use your voice in the course of the day? as well as the noise factor. How, how much louder do you have to talk perhaps because you're talking outdoors over the sound of traffic noise um, or you're in one of your pool exercise classes, we, we only wish right now, um, and it's clattery, but you wanna talk with your, um, your mates in the, in the pool. Um, some of us use our voices less. We are more the reclusive people like I am um, and Others of us like to just talk a lot and share a lot of our feelings through our voices. Other common lifestyle factors include ergonomics. Um, so on the left, we have a scenario that many of us are much more familiar with in the last year or so, um, where we're enjoying more of our social activities and even undergoing a lot of our work events using computer screens. And then there are other um, props such as the way we use telephones that can misalign our bodies. Emotional factors um, can be incredibly important overriding factors in determining the muscle tone in the whole voice system. Um, and some of the important factors that may contribute to extra muscle tone in the 
in the voice box, for example, the larynx, um, or in our jaws, if we tend to um, clench our jaws if we're stressed, in the back of the neck and the shoulders, where a lot of people notice they store their stressors. Um, we, as adults, I tend to think of us as expert. Um, one of my patients once called it trash compacting. Um, we, we've learned by the time we're adults that it's not always appropriate to connect our limbic or emotional center directly with our voices, the way it was designed to be um, connected. So we will often create tension in our larynx so that we're not even tempted to scream if we're afraid or yell if we're angry or cry if we're feeling sad. Um, or perhaps if we're in the middle of a church service and something strikes us as funny, we're, we don't start giggling out loud. Um, so we've learned that there are certain social appropriate ways to use our voices and other situations where we really should not use the vocal correlate of an emotion we feel. And if we get really good at that, we tend to be wandering around with a pretty tight larynx because as a valve system, it's very, very effective at keeping us from from emitting those sounds that reflect how we feel. So we may put on the, uh, I call it the perma smile, clench our jaws and spread our lips back and try to look like we're happy when we may not actually be enjoying ourselves. And inside of our larynx, there may be a lot of squeezing or I call it valving um, that will certainly affect how well we can use our voices. Reflux factors are just incredibly common contributors to tension in the larynx and a variety of symptoms that you you and even your doctors may um, have, have misrepresented as something else. So the tension that's created in the larynx by the fact that the vagus nerve derives sensory information from your esophagus relays it back to your brainstem and then instructs your larynx on what to do will cause various types of tension and sensory awareness. This can lead to symptoms like feeling like there's a lump or a ball in your throat or just a thick mucus um, sensation. We call this globus because um, it feels, a lot of people will say kind of like there's a globe in there. It may lead to some hoarseness it may lead to some effortful swallowing or choking a little more often. And it may lead to some other symptoms like chronic coughing or throat clearing. So it's really important to understand this element um, and what to do about it. There are many lifestyle factors that can be very helpful, such as tipping your bed up so that fluid flows down towards your stomach when you're sleeping, rather than just rolling along the, um, the esophagus. Um, I don't have time to go through it today, but you may want to look up a resource that I show my, my patients and clients um, pretty much every time I see someone new. Um, on YouTube, under my channel, you will find a tutorial on laryngopharyngeal reflux symptoms, such as the ones we just described. And, in, and the tutorial is called, But Doctor, I Don't Have Heartburn. So it's relatively easy to find. Technique factors. Um, I believe Mark's gonna give you a little more detail on some of this, um, but we, we never forget the importance of posture and alignment on the whole vocal mechanism. Um, in, uh, adequate and healthy posture leads to freedom between the breathing structures, the vibrating structure in your larynx and all the articulators um, that live in your head. So, um, Head and neck alignment and um, general appropriate body alignment is incredibly important in ensuring the vocal system works in a healthy way. Um, sometimes during voice therapy, we do some, some exercises that literally start at the top of the face because the top of the face communicates much more directly with the limbic system in the brain, the emotional center then does the lower face where we can create um, systems we call emblems, um, such as the perma smile, where it looks like we're trying to smile, but maybe the upper part of our face doesn't look very happy because it's more in touch with the, uh, the emotional brain. Um, working on jaw 
activities that release jaw tension are often important in therapy programs. Um, we work on various approaches to learning about appropriate speech breathing because breathing and airflow from the lungs is literally what powers the, the vocal fold vibration. And we talked a little bit about resonance by using the resonators in your face appropriately, you get vocal power and vocal beauty without any extra effort. Um, we often wanna work on vocal flexibility, doing some fun um, activities with sounds sliding up and down and using straws and doing all sorts of fun things. So um, quick overview of the alert model and I hope you found it helpful. Thank you so much for that, Linda. That was super helpful and I think flows really well into um, Mark's next topic. Um, so thank you so much for that. Um, so our last speaker today is Mark Basic. Um, Mark is a certified Alexander Technique teacher and has a Master of Occupational Therapy from UBC and holds a Bachelor in Music um, from the Capilano University Jazz Studies Program. With his unique background in embodied movement, rehab rehabilitation and music, uh, Mark teaches his students to reconnect to and develop their intrinsic poise through many stages and challenges of life. Um, he teaches out the Alexander Technique in the Acting and Stage and Screen Program at Capilano University's Theater Department, and he also runs a private practice comprised of select dedicated students working to overcome movement impairments due to injury or illness, and to optimize their performance in a wide variety of fields requiring mindful movement. Um, he's also a member of uh, the leading international research organization for Alexander Technique, and was the executive co-director of the Alexander Te Technique Canada from 2015 to 2018. So with that, um, I'll invite Mark to start his presentation. Thank you very much for having me. I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, thank you again for the introduction. And thank you also to Sherry uh, Zelanzi and, and Dr. Linda Ramage for their really insightful and helpful talks. My name is Mark Vasek, and I'm here to talk today about the Alexander Technique. So I'm a certified Alexander teacher, as was mentioned, I have a Master of Occupational Therapy from the University of British Columbia. But my Alexander story really started about 20 years ago when the Alexander Technique helped me overcome a chronic pain issue. So today, actually, many of my friends know me as the guy who had an arm injury, disappeared for a few years, and then reappeared having overcome his injury with the side effect of great posture. But in reality, my injury was actually just the start of my own journey to learn how awareness, intention, posture, and movement connect to our wellness. So what is the Alexander Technique and, and how does this relate to you? Well, in the Alexander Technique, you learn to sense and change patterns of unhelpful tension that have unconsciously become a part of how you move, breathe, and act in your life. What makes the Alexander Technique different is that rather than trying to directly relax all the tensions in your body, we're trying to fix specific tensions, pains, or postures through exercises. You instead learn to consciously address your coordination from head to toe of postural support, movement, and breathing directly in the activities and movements of your life. With practice, you move more easily from collapsed or closed or constricted and tight to more open, balanced, aware, and lightening up into movement. Now, Alexander lessons are mainly taught by one-on-one -on -one personal instruction, like in the picture you see here, with a mixture of skilled and subtle hands-on and verbal guidance. In some settings, it's also taught in group classes, and due to COVID, some teachers such as myself now teach online to those students who can best benefit. So where did this all come from? Well, what you'll see here is two photos of Frederick Matthias, or FM Alexander, he was the originator of the Alexander Technique, and he was actually born in Tasmania, Australia in 1869, so quite a while ago. He developed his technique in response to persistent voice issues he was having when working as an actor. Over time, he discovered that his work seemed to help people with a large range of postural and tension-related issues. So in 1904, he moved to London, where he taught his technique in England and the United States until 1955. Today, well, here we go. Today, the Alexander Technique is part of training in the top performing art schools around the world. And people from all backgrounds and stages of life uh, are coming to learn the Alexander Technique to support 
health challenges such as back pain, neck pain, Parkinson's disease, and others are simply coming to improve posture, or simply feel better uh, in their lives. So that's a little bit of a background on the Alexander technique. And although I can't reach through the computer screen to use my hands to give you the experience of our lesson, or even see you actually, we can still explore some Alexander technique based awareness games here. And I've been asked to make this a little more experiential and a little less theoretical as the last talk. So we get to play a little bit. We'll be playing in standing or sitting and doing a little bit of walking around your computer. So if you feel comfortable and safe at home, you can play along. And remember, there's no right or wrong in what we'll be doing. So don't worry if your experience is different at all, okay? So to begin here, we can see that the Alexander Technique has two important parts that interact with each other. Our, well, here we are, our awareness and our intention. And well, let's begin by starting to grow our awareness of ourselves. So here's a funny question for you. I want you to, if you can, stand up with me at home. If you're comfortable sitting, you're welcome to stay there as well. And I want you to take a moment and ask yourself, wait a second, where does my head balance on top of my spine or up on top of my neck? Where would that be? So if you want, you could kind of, don't worry, it's not an anatomy test here. You can take your fingers and you can try and point to somewhere, where does your head balance on your spine? You know, is it kind of down here? Is it up here, back here? Where is that for you? Take a moment, see if you can take a guess. Use your fingers and point to approximately where you feel your head balances on top of your spine. Okay, so do you think you found the spot? Well, let's, let's have a look here. All right, so what we see here are two images of a skeleton. And what we can maybe notice is that the spine actually goes up quite high and the head balances almost up in between your ears. In fact, if you take your fingers, you can find there's two little spots just underneath your ears there. And you can kind of be silly with me, taking your hands and drawing a line right through your head and somewhere in the middle there, way up high here, your head's actually balancing up here all on its own. And so if you want, you can play a game. You can try and look up and down very gently moving, maybe to the left and to the right, just exploring what it's like to move with your head balanced way up there in between your ears. Wonderful. Now I want you to take a moment and say, okay, well, where did I think it was? If you thought it was down here like I did a long time ago, what is it like to move with a head thinking of it being in a different spot? Balanced maybe lower or maybe further back here where we can feel the skull, that's often where we think it is. See what it's like to move from there. Does it change how it feels? Does it change the smoothness or the quality of the movement? Okay, well, this is something we can start to play with. So. If you're willing to, you can try this now just a little bit in standing. And what we're gonna be doing is just doing a little bit of movement at home. If you're in sitting, you can of course stay there. You can play with those ideas. Is we're just gonna do a little bit of walking and we're gonna say, what happens if we let our head be balanced up between our ears in that weird place that this guy is talking about? And what if we just walk around a little bit with that thought of letting our head be balancing up there all on its own? Just seeing what that's like. You can try it out with me, just for a moment, walking around. Okay. Now I want you to see if you can forget about that for a moment and just try sitting or walking in your normal way. See what that's like. See what that feels like, what you notice in your own body, how you sense playing with awareness then. And if you want, you can even come on back and say, oh yeah, what if I let my head be balanced way up there? Okay, so that's our first game, playing with head balance. Now, what you might have noticed is that how you think is really connected into how you move and carry yourself and how we carry tensions in the body. This was mentioned also earlier in such nice ways and how those connect and how we can squish ourselves or get tight 
or be balanced and open. Now, we're gonna play one more game for today. And in this game, we're gonna do three different kinds of walking or three different kinds of sitting. In the very first kind, I want you to think of this one being relaxed, okay? So this is our normal way of walking or sitting. And we're going to stand and walk or sit as if you were feeling really tired and lazy. You know, it's at the end of a very long day or after the end of a very long talk, you guys have been very patient, nobody's watching and just, you really just don't care about your posture. See what that's like. Just feeling what that relaxed heaviness is like in you. You can walk with it and move with it or just sit with that and feel what that's like in your body. Okay, so that's number one. Come on back for a moment. In number two, what I want you to do is I want you to think of an effortful posture. Sometimes we think of this as being perfect posture. And I'd like you to use muscular effort to pull yourself up to your greatest height. Pull your head up, lift your chest, lift and tighten your core muscles in your torso. Think of holding yourself up in military posture as best you can. Pulling yourself to your greatest height, okay? Now, if you're sitting, you can feel what that does to your breathing and to the tension in your body, just seeing what that changes for you. If you're walking, you can move around and see how that affects your walk, maybe affects your balance, maybe changes things for you. Okay, all right. I'm gonna pause there and stop that because I'm actually getting quite tired doing that. And if you're like me, just a regular human, you'll find that we often kind of feel ourselves collapsed. And then we say, nope, I've got to fix it. And we pull ourselves up with all our force. But that only lasts for a couple minutes or so, or maybe 30 seconds. And then we run out of steam and we fall back down. And it's quite frustrating. So that's our effortful posture. We're going to do one last one. And in this one, what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, OK, well, what if we imagine that our head is balanced up between our ears, way up here. Kind of you can find that in that little notch underneath your ears. And we're gonna imagine that our head is just balanced or floating up there. And that we have a sense of lightness in our body as if our body is lightening up, our bones are lightening up. And we're gonna allow our bones to send us up. We want to go up, but we're not gonna actually do it with muscular effort. We're just going to think of lightening up and letting our head float on top of your spine. So if you're walking, you can walk with me a little bit now without thought of the head balancing and lightening up and lightening up through your bones. And if you want now, you can switch and you can go back to relax. See what that feels like in your body. See what you can sense in yourself. And then we can go right to perfect posture, effortful, try that out. Put that one on, see what that feels like. And now let's come back to lightening up. Let's let our head be balancing up between our ears, going upwards. Let's let our bones, our spine, skeleton support us from the ground. And we'll come back to this place of balance. Okay, so what we just did there was play a little game. And we did a game that was really similar to a recent study in 2020 on posture. And what they found was that people who thought of upright posture as being really tight and effortful actually made balance worse and they actually increased their falls risk. And this is pretty consistent with a emerging uh, body of research that looks at effortful straight posture is not as helpful as we think it is. Instead, it seemed that thinking of posture as more of an effortless upwards intention of in this case, allowing our head to balance and your body to lighten upwards actually seem to help improve balance and reduce falls. So what we can take a look at now, just to summarize for today in our little games is that we noticed instead of trying to find perfect posture by holding, we can become a little clear anatomically on actually where we are balanced from, and then we can change our intention. We can know that our thinking affects the way we move in our lives and we can begin to allow our head to balance up on top of the spine and our whole selves to lighten upwards. So thank you so much for your time and if you have any questions you can of course reach out to me. I'll include some other links here 
with research that you can take a look at. And thank you again for your time. Thank you so much, Mark, for um, that and for the little movement break um, during our day. That was really awesome. Uh, we have a couple of minutes here for a quick question and answer from our speakers. Um, I've gotten a couple of questions here in the chat, but please feel free to continue to type in your questions um, and I'll filter them and um, ask our guests right now. Um, so we have a question here asking if there are any resources or websites or books that show uh, or walk us through the exercises for um, the different things that we have listed out, like according to the alert model or the Alexander technique, um, where can participants kind of find um, more resources for those? Maybe a question for Linda or for Mark. Certainly, I, I'm happy to send in the slides some various links and I'll send these to Katie at BC Brain Wellness so then she can pass these on to people and they can, I'm sure, find them through links on the BC Brain Wellness site, but you'll have to confirm that with Katie because she's really the one in charge over there. <laughs> um, yes, uh, if you, uh, the resources that Matt, uh, Mark passes along, we can post them onto our website as well under this event. I think Mark's the expert on the Alexander technique. I've, I've done a lot of Alexander work myself and I incorporate a lot of the concepts into my therapies. Um, and, and literally my Bible, um, when I first started working in that area, um, was the original um, writing by um, uh, a medical doctor. I'm trying to think of his name. You, you probably know Mark. I mean, Dr. Wilfred Barlow. Barlow, um, easy to read. Um, and, and that's how I started learning about um, the, the origin of the Alexander Technique. Awesome, great. Um, and we have a question here specifically in terms of um, dystonia, if there's any literature or um, things like that where it shows that speech therapy or the Alexander Technique helping out with um, Estonia? I, th I think I would start with the uh, Dystonia Association websites um, for more information uh, for resources. And then if you're looking for a local speech language pathologist, the two resources that I, I mentioned, the College Register and Speech and Hearing BC, um, people often will put down their areas of special interest. Um, but also again, you know, I'm always happy to uh, direct people um, to the right resources. So either accessing uh, through an association, the Dystonia Association or uh, using some local resources, I think is the best place to start so we can help uh, direct people the right way. Yeah, in regards to the Alexander technique, there's no specific research that I know that's directly on dystonia yet. Um, I think Sherry's answer is really excellent and I would absolutely recommend exactly what she's recommended um, to start to search out um, some assistance and help through those resources. Perfect. Um, and with that, we are at one o'clock. So um, we'll conclude today's session. Thank you so much for um, to each of our three speakers for presenting that really informative information, um, providing really great talks um, to us today. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us today for our May Wellness Wednesday as well. We'll see you next month for our June Wellness Wednesday. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thanks.